Good morning. I hope you're having a really good morning. So in human terms, bonding is a development process of close interpersonal relationships. And often this is with family members or friends, but it can also be in groups. And what bonding does, it goes beyond that simple liking of somebody. And it's important for us as humans. We seek it. We're driven to it through emotion. To have that connection with someone else. We need emotional responses. We need those connections. I kind of think of us as that primate needing a hug. When it comes down to it, the world is kind of a scary place. And we need to feel connected. We need that because we feel this wide range of emotions. It's quite incredible how wide our range is that we feel. And when we feel that in other people, we then relate to them. And an emotional connection then adds to that bond we have with someone. We recognize them as being human. Almost by complete contrast, the web has never been very good at being human, at giving us that contact we crave. Interactions are cold, they're clinical. It's kind of ironic that it feels like the web has been created more for robots than the humans that actually created it. We've created a world where we actually don't thrive, where our worst parts of humanity come to the front. I'm sure we've all had frustrating online experiences, more than one frustrating online experience as well, something that felt like it was an exercise in designing for robots rather than in designing for you. The easiest one I can think of is online banking. Despite trying as they might, it feels like my online bank thwart me at every attempt to do something even simple. It's almost like the simplest of tasks is like some epic quest to get some enchanted hat or something equally as preposterous. It just seems to be overly complicated. So there's this thing called pareidolia, and it's where you see a familiar pattern in or a stimulus in something that doesn't actually exist. A good example of this is something that a lot of us have done, which is lying on our back, looking at clouds, and seeing maybe, well, the easy one would be a sheep, but seeing different animals or seeing different shapes. So it's actually a website. I'd strongly encourage you to check out Things With Faces. Uh, it shows our predisposition to make things less robotic, to try and bond, no matter if there actually isn't really a face there, to try and make that connection with even inanimate objects. And there's also this amazing Twitter account. And this shows our natural tendency to make that inhuman human. And I love this example because it goes even further than the, the kind of seeing a face. We're actually inferring emotion onto the object as well. We crave so much that, we, that connection that we even infer it. Creating an interface that has compassion, that cares for the human using it. This is how we go beyond those robotic interfaces that leave us cold. The thing is, if love and compassion in the real world aren't actually luxuries, we have to ask ourselves, why are they online? Because they are, and they feel that way. As we live more and more interfaced, we need to create experiences that are just as empathic, just as connected to being human. So what is pixel bonding? Well, in simple terms, it's about sticking with the experience and getting users to do that. But it goes beyond that, to getting users to come back, to getting them to engage in the experience. And when a user bonds with the experience, it becomes part of their routine. It becomes their ingrained behavior, part of their model. If you think about how social networks and apps work, perhaps it's not something that you're going to use every day, but when you need it for that particular purpose, you go back to it. You've bonded with it. And generally, you're returning because you've had a positive experience. And there's also something which is going to become a thread throughout what I'm going to be speaking about today, which is trust. Trust is key, and trust is pretty much everything when you're talking about bonding with an experience. So the way people are fans, almost to the point of devotion, and how groups of people can do it, is fascinating and an example of bonding. So this little fellow is Wapu, 
and this is next to the WordPress logo. So Wapu is actually the mascot for the WordPress community. But WordPress always had a logo. And but since 2011, Wapu appeared and has really, really taken off. And it's really interesting to compare against the logo that actually already existed. Each WordCamp, so WordCamp is the name for the local WordPress conference, actually has their own WAPU. From Australia to Nepal to Japan to England and America, WAPU is dressed up in invariably the costume of that area. And this kind of Pokemon thing goes on where people have to collect all the WAPUs, and there's this passion to collect them all. There's even a sponsor that now has a real-life WAPU costume, which shows how far this has gone. And the passion behind WAPU reflects the passion of the community, way more than that WordPress logo did. The WordPress logo worked, but it didn't reflect that passion. And WordPress isn't actually a success because of WAPU, but the sense of community, the sense of being more human, that bonding, that uniting, that's helped, that's fostered by WAPU. And it's right for the community, and that's really important when you're talking about this. You have to know what's right for the people. So it's actually really, really important, before I go too much further, to take a little pause and think about ethics. When you start dealing with emotions and bonding, you need to remember you are dealing with humans. There should kind of be a sign that you have up as a mantra, which is, humans handle with care. From dark patterns to sketchy herding, don't make someone do something they usually wouldn't do. Persuasions and dark gains, they only lead to a bad interface and a bad user experience. The reality is there is actually no magic bullet. People see through manipulation and then they're never going to trust again. We really need to not confuse brand love with love of relatives or friends and be realistic about what we're creating. If you want to create a more human experience, you need to be empathic to all that it means to be human. If you look around the room, we're incredibly varied. And humans, we're kind of a messy lot. Even in this small subgroup, we're very varied. If you then move that out to being all of humanity, we're so different. What I'm really talking about is creating interfaces for all your users a mindful interface that cares about the human using it. As said in this quote, graceful empathy is about ensuring all users get a great experience, an emotional experience, a connected experience, that human experience. And there's lots of balancing and lots of consideration, but it's really, really worth it. The thing is, it's not just about cute things. And cute is great in context, don't get me wrong. But Disneyfying all the UI things probably isn't a great approach to user experience. You don't need anime eyes or bouncing animations just to make real connections. In fact, cute is often an easy win and has a light bond rather than the deep connection that you really want with your users. Creating emotional experiences goes beyond that and is really, really powerful. It's about balance, because when it comes down to it, and we all know this as humans, too much emotion isn't good for us. So in all of this, delight is a really powerful force. And as humans, delight is an incredibly powerful force for us. And it leads to that kind of bond, that connection that I've been talking about. So I like to think of uh, these moments of delight as moments of squee. So why do I do that? Because I don't know about you, but when I experience an interface that gives me delight, I actually make out an audible noise that sounds like that. So for me, those little UI touches or experiences, they actually, and for everybody, they make us feel cared for. They make us feel like someone has consciously crafted that experience, has thought about what we're going to feel and what we're going to experience. The thing is, there's a little bit of a problem with those kind of moments of squee. They can very easily turn to the moments of face palm. Because what's cute and appropriate for me probably isn't cute and appropriate for you. We have to be incredibly careful. So Sarah, who is a co-author of a book I'd highly recommend reading with Eric Meyer called Design for Real Life, 
actually in an article wrote recently about the Google Mail drop, the mic incident. So I don't know if you know about this incident, but it was an April fool that went a slightly array. So there was a button added, and this button sent an uh, animated GIF of a minion dropping the mic, and then you would never get emails back. And what seems great maybe in a team, and maybe was appropriate for that team, when it actually expanded to the wider kind of user base, wasn't. People were clicking the button when they didn't want to. People were not getting emails. It just went horribly, horribly wrong. And it illustrates the point, what seems quaint and cute to you may not in another context. And we have to be incredibly conscious about what we're making and not kind of look inward to the people that we're creating it with. I mean, something like the mic drop happens, trust is broken. And it kind of can be just this small little tear, but it can also fracture completely. And when it does that, it means that someone is never going to use that product again. They're done. They're out of there. They're not going to use that product. Trust is really fag fragile and needs constant reassurance. I kind of think of trust a little bit like a plant that you need to kind of nurture and water and really take care of. Very, very delicate plant. If you think about how the brands that you remember now from your childhood, if you think about those, or you think about the brands that you actually trust, there's a connection, there's a bond that's built up over time. But the thing is, we're not actually blind fans. Our trust can be broken all too easily, that trust can be broken. So I actually have my own experience with Fitbit that has actually taught me how fragile my own trust is. I've had a lot of Fitbits, and I've really enjoyed them, and it fits in with, I've, I've enjoyed the experience. However, I actually had a poorly Fitbit the first time I had anything go wrong. And I got stuck in email hell, which is the best description of what happened to me. I kept on having to repeat in a kind of pre-def loop about the first line of, I was just hitting that first line all the time of experience. It was horrendous for me. And each time I had to repeat, I ranted to my friends, I ranted to my work colleagues, I ranted to my husband, every single person I could. I, it was just getting worse for me, this experience. And in the end, I got a replacement, all was well, I'm happy again with my Fitbit. However, it's tainted my experience. Whenever I think of Fitbit, I now have that experience that I've now tied to it. Yes, the product still works for me, but I now, if someone asked me what their support was like, I would probably tell you to not bother contacting them. Along with trust goes likability. So I hate to say this, but as humans, we're really fickle. We respond better to things and people that we like. That's just the way it is. It's just part of being human. We have these almost invisible meters in our brains that tally up the variables. Is it trustworthy? Is it likable? Is it the right thing for me? And if something looks good, if something works well, and it also does good, that's a powerful connection for us. And as humans, we want to be liked and make things that are liked as well. There's this thing that happens when you see a smile. It's these mirror neurons that kick in, and then you smile as well. The simple act of smiling also makes you feel better and happier. There's these endorphins that are released as you smile. And also, we notice the smile far more than we notice any other facial expression. We're seeking that neuron hit as humans. We actually seek positive experiences. And we seek out those feedbacks, even more so in the flat, unresponsive digital world. We crave that. But the thing is, how can you actually connect with someone you don't know? Really difficult? I would say that you can't do that. You need to know the users. You need to know all your users that you're creating an experience for. You need to know how to interact. In the real world, when you interact with someone, even now when I'm speaking to you, I'm getting feedback from you. I'm getting some connection. And we can learn how to do that in our experience. And that's how we start making these interfaces that create bonding. So one example would be Slack. And what they do is if you're in the time zone uh, and 
they create this kind of adaptive experience. So those people that should be asleep due to their time zones are shown. There's a little indication. This is good for both users. So as someone that was going to contact someone, you'd probably be more likely to wait for their response. And then as someone that was actually going to be contacted, you'd know you don't have to give a response. So it's kind of this double feedback for people. It's a win-win in a user interface. And it's also telling you something about that person, which is really, really important for us. It's giving us a little bit of feedback. When we're children, we love to explore. And this actually continues into adulthood. There's this innate part of human nature to kind of be discovery and have a fascination with that. It's a force that drives us. And if you combine that with delight in an interface, it's a great way to get those moments of squee and positive moments. For example, this is a real world example. A few mom uh, months ago, I was out exploring a city with some people and we went to get a cold tea drink. It was a great drink, but I don't actually remember the drink because of how it tasted. I remember it because when I screwed off the top of the lid, I actually discovered this little face there with a little person saying something. And that was delightful for me. And then someone who was also there had exactly the same drink and did the same with the lid, and the person was saying something different. And we laughed, and it was a kind of second moment of delight. It became a positive moment with that product. I now smile when I remember that. And I probably will want to try that product again. I actually want to see what else this little figure says. Does it say different things in different? Does it say 10 things? Does it say a different thing every time? It's delightful for me. I even took a picture and I shared this picture because I had that moment of delight. I wanted to pass that on. And Kickstarter have this hidden footer that as you click through, you, the scissor kind of reveals more. It's a fun interaction. But it's not a required part of the interface. You could use the site and still get a full experience without it. But it brings that extra, more playfulness. And it also brings a sense of pride for us in knowing something that someone else doesn't maybe know. And we all like that as humans. Slack also has this with their emoji picker. It's really, really small flourish, but notice as you hover over it, the little smile. These little UI Easter eggs are incredibly powerful. When we find them, we get that squeal of delight. We get that happiness. And when we find that, people will remember the interface for that. Have you ever used something and felt that the makers of that product or that interface understood you, that they got you? Well, I have. And that feeling, is, for me, is priceless. And I'm sure you have felt that as well. It gives you the impression you value the user as someone that created that. And the user feels you cared about them. Maybe it's a simple autofill being kind of on point. Or maybe it's like Netflix in this quote. It's about taking time to really understand all your users and taking care to give them that appropriate experience. I will just say a little bit of a note of caution here. Too much of this can be a bit creepy. Nobody likes stalker interfaces. Remember that trust thing and that kind of delicate plant? If you do too much of this, then the trust is going to be broken. As of everything, trust and balance. If you can take home anything from this talk, I'd like you to take home trust and balance. Being compassionate is a big part of being human. It's just part of what we do. And we respect people for being compassionate. We value them. And when an interface does that, that's incredible. I kind of think interfaces should be your friends, because friends don't let friends make mistakes. And your interface shouldn't let users make mistakes. You should see the errors or predict the errors before they actually happen. You know, put covers over the holes. Don't let users just fall into the holes and be your testers. Users being testers is really not a good thing. This is also something about humans that means we actually unite through adversity. And if you actually help someone 
go when there's a kind of some adversity that you go through, they will be more than likely to remember you over the adversity. Remember I said we kind of want to be positive? We will try and remember the positive helping that we got over the bad thing that happened. That's powerful. And someone like MailChimp understands this. They have a great safety message that shows taking that extra care, that extra consideration. It's fun, but it also serves a great purpose to really make sure you want to do that. And then it also celebrates with each stage because MailChimp's your friend, they've got your back, they're there for you. And then, like any friend, they celebrate your success. This process is telling you a lot about the personality of the product. It's telling you about the care that they have for you as a user, and it's building that bond. We should be creating helping UI. Uh, if you think about in gaming terms, there's tips and tricks and ways that you can level up your character. We should be doing the same with our interfaces, like Vimeo here has a tool tip. So if you're a regular user, you can become kind of a, a master user in the sense of this interface by knowing these tips and tricks and really leveling up. These help you to use the interface better and have a better experience. GitHub also offers a way to suggest licenses. If you know something is going to happen, then you don't just wait for buttons to click and kind of respond and then connect. You offer that emotional support when lost, offer that almost conversational UI that feels connected with the user, that feels bonded. When an interface is more human, it allows us to be more human. As I said earlier, often in our interactions, we aren't great online. When it comes to communication, the reality is the web really isn't great for allowing expression. When we do give people space to communicate and express, we usually give them this, a big input field, a button, generally with the word submit in capital letters. I don't know about you, but I kind of wonder most of the time how we ever get any positive comments online when this is the standard. It, it doesn't bring out the best positive side of our nature. It doesn't allow us to be the good humans that we actually are. And if it's not this, it's a binary thumbs up or like button. That doesn't happen. If you are talking to me, and I agree with you, I wouldn't just do that, stare blankly at you and hold my thumb up. I also, if I don't agree with something you're saying, I wouldn't just walk off or just stand there blankly, not speaking to you. I'd interact. We don't have that online, and we need to find ways to do that more. Facebook reactions is one recent exploration into stepping towards more real communication. And it's really important that I say this, it's a step. It's not the whole story, and we should just continue doing more of this. We shouldn't see Facebook reactions as the way to do it, and we're done. This conveys a full spectrum of human emotion and a way for users to really express themselves. The way it's really done is interesting because it feels natural. It doesn't feel a disrupted kind of interface. It feels natural, it feels right. It doesn't feel that new either because it fits. And allowing people to communicate as humans, there's this weird thing that it means they actually communicate more effectively. And they actually have more positive emotional experiences. And I don't know about you, but I think that's something the web really, really needs. When we experience something good, we can't but help pass it on. As I said, we're actually predisposed to be happy and then make others happy. When we actually make someone happy, this releases chemicals. So it's a win-win for humankind. I'm making you happy, you're getting your chemicals, I'm getting my chemicals. Humankind wins. If you think about how memes work, that's exactly it. I experience something happy, and then I'm sharing that happy with someone as well. 
What happens when you have a bad experience? Okay? What happens when I had that experience with Fitbit? Did I just keep that to myself? Or did I rant about it to anyone that would listen? And have I also shared about it in this talk? This is the thing. When we have something negative or positive, we have this need to share it. Twitter and online social outlets, they make it even easier for us to share. How many times have you actually seen someone rant or praise online? It's pretty much a daily occurrence, right? Someone's doing that through some medium. And there's this phrase which I think is really important and we need to bear in mind, which is a problem shared is a problem halved. That humans will do that. They will pass the good on and they will pass the bad on. So we have to remember this when we're creating things and we can use this in the interfaces we're creating. The experience of interacting with an interface. It should be more than just a click. Users crave an experience that gives positive, that gives appropriate emotional feedback. A bonded user is invested, engaged, and priceless. In everything you do, you need to create and be aware of the human interacting. Because, as I said earlier, as humans, we crave that connection. And making that connection is really, really powerful. There's nothing like feeling that a product gets you and really understands you. Pixel bonding really is about making experiences that connect, that get the user they are being created for. And when it comes down to it, it's really about, as humans, actually making the web for humans. And that's something we should all be doing. So my slides are here. Thank you very much.